Perhaps it's fitting that today's interview is a play in three acts. After all, I'm talking to Melanie Diesel, speaker, author, and founder of Story Fuel. It makes sense that we talk about creating good content in three acts, idea generation, brand deals, and coming up with headlines. This discussion is completely packed with fantastic advice to help your content creation game. So here's what I want you to look for. What to focus on when coming up with good content. How to get brand sponsored deals and how they are more of a collaboration. And how to write good headlines by remembering that they're really a formula. So definitely look for all of those things. I loved this conversation with Melanie. It was one of my favorites. And right after I went and I bought her resources from her website, storyfuel.co. You can find a link to all of her resources and everything that we talked about over on the show notes page at howibuilt.it slash 288. Four. But for now, let's get to the intro and then the interview. According to the New York Times, 81% of people want to write a book. I'm one of them. And if you're one of them too, and you want to actually make money as a result of your book, Entrepreneur Publishing Academy, hosted by New York Times bestselling author Anna David, is for you. Every week, she either answers a question about how to build a business with your book or interviews a best-selling author or top entrepreneur. Guests have included everyone from Chris Voss to Adam Carolla, Jay Abraham, and Robert Green. Named a Best Publishing Podcast by LA Weekly, Feedspot, and Kindlepreneur, Entrepreneur Publishing Academy is your fun weekly lesson that will show you why a book is the best business card and how to make and maximize yours. You can get a link in the description or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast where you get free coaching calls from successful creators. Each week, you get actionable advice on how you can build a better content business to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. Melanie, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing fantastically. Uh, I am. This is like recording week for me for the next batch of episodes. <laughs> and uh, I love this is my favorite part of my week is having these conversations. So thanks so much for joining us. It's really the best. It's the favorite part of my week, too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so we had a great pre-show conversation. And the first thing I'm just going to ask you straight off the bat is, um, how do you come up with ideas for content? I talk to a lot of people <laughs> that are like, I don't even know what to like write about or make a video about. Um, so what are, what's, what's your advice? You know, there's uh, a lot of different ways you could go about this. I love like jumping right into it like this. I think the the first thing that I always like to talk about before we get to the idea uh, generating portion is what we actually mean when we say a content idea, because I think that this very this environment that we all create in and that we consume content in has us very focused on the formats that we use to deliver our content, and we can sometimes get so focused on the format that we think you know, just the word video means it's a content idea or just the word Mm. infographic or just the word blog. But we've kind of lost sight in those cases of the the actual message. Like, what is it that we're trying to say? So I always like to start by saying that when we're coming up with a content idea, we're actually coming up with two things. What is it that we're trying to say? That's your message, your topic, your perspective. And then how are we going to say it? That's the format. That's, you know, video, article, podcast, whatever else. So I think that separation up front is really important because it helps it helps us make sure that we're focusing on the right things and that we're not losing sight of what our actual message is in favor of like some shiny new delivery method in the form of a of a format because I think there's so many new formats coming out it's really easy to just get you know get attracted to the shiny new object yeah. or the creative challenge of a new format and and kind of lose sight of your strategy or your purpose when you're doing that yeah, that makes perfect sense. And actually, um, I have I've now referenced this in the previous two episodes, but I've recorded an episode with uh, Kara Chase, who talks about not using other people's playbooks and uh, not getting caught up in the tools. And I feel like with content, it's the same thing. It's like all of a sudden, I'm told by everybody I need to be on TikTok, and I'm like. <laughs> 
I don't, I don't know if TikTok is right for the things I'm promoting or the content I'm creating. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, that's the exact right mindset to have, right? Where we're excited about the potential of new formats, but not distracted by the potential of new formats. Because, you know, for some business types, for some, you know, professionals or, or even some personality types, like TikTok might be awesome. I have uh, a friend and colleague who just started using TikTok to promote the business. And, you know, it's a perfect fit. It's the right kind of delivery for their content. They have the right personality to keep things exciting. It, it works perfectly. But I also have plenty of other colleagues who the idea of them being on video is like scary to them, right? Or that's not their their comfort space. And so in those cases, it's like, well, let's take a look at what it is that you're trying to share. What What is your message? What is the the contents of your content, right? And where can we put that content in a way that's going to most suit the message and the person who has to deliver it. Because, you know, just because a format exists or a platform exists doesn't mean that one, you have to be there. And two, that there's much strategic benefit to you being there. Yeah, I love that. And it, it again, like I have had a couple of guests previously um, who've talked about the benefits of TikTok. And like by the end of those, I'm just going to pick on TikTok right now. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was like really excited by the end of those episodes to get on and try try TikTok and I saw like some success, but all of my videos were like me in front of the camera giving some piece of advice, like very like professorial, I guess, because that is, I've, I have classroom experience. Um, and the advice I got was like, well, you have to like do, you got to do like maybe half like memes or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to dance. Like if I have to do that, I'm not going to do it. You got to wear um, a wig. You gotta, you yeah. gotta dance. Yeah, right. <laughs> like find like a green screen and do the one. Like I, it's just like, whereas on on YouTube, for example, my kind of content uh, fits a little bit better. Right, people are looking for this answer to a specific question, um, and they're not looking. Ne- they're not only looking to be entertained. There, they're looking for kind of this just in time knowledge boost. Yeah, and I think that's that's the right place to think about it. And I know we sort of started talking about content ideas, but I think this is the right foundation, right? Because even if you're creating the right content, if it's in the wrong place or it's being delivered the wrong way, it's not going to have the impact that it should. So starting with, you know, where are you producing this content? Where is it going to live? Is a, is a really great way to level set and make sure that you're putting all this brainstorming effort, you know, toward the right thing. Yeah. So my follow-up co- uh, question there is, you know, I have a blog. <laughs> a friend of mine described me yesterday as a prolific writer, and I don't view myself as that. But then, like, he told me, like, most people have trouble starting, and like, a first draft is my jam. Like, I'll just put <laughs> words on pages. Yeah. Um, so, like, I blog, I have this and another podcast, uh, and I have, well, technically, I have two YouTube channels, but for all intents and purposes, <laughs> I have one that I'm actually focusing on. Mm-hmm. Um, so m- I guess maybe my question is like, how do you know, uh, what do you think about when you think about where you're producing the content, right? Cause I'll just write down, I'll get an idea and I'll put it into Airtable is where all of my content ideas live. Um, and then I'll say like YouTube or podcast or whatever. Um, so when you're thinking about kind of knowing where you produce it first, what's your process like? Do you have like a, okay, I'm going to sit down and think about YouTube videos um, mm. or or is it like more like broader topics and like, okay, this this specific thing in this broader topic is good for video, this is good for podcast, yes. et cetera? Yes, that, exactly that. So uh, I always say focus before format. So if you know the message that you're trying to share, the follow-up question you ask is, what's the best way for me to share this message? So say you get an idea, there's a particular topic uh, that you want to teach your audience. And I would look at that and say, okay, well, to tell this story right, to, to cover this topic the right way, does it require visuals? If yes, then here are the formats that are going to be best for that, right? Maybe that one shouldn't necessarily be just a podcast episode because it doesn't have the visuals that I need to really get this point across. Or does this need audio? Do, do they need to hear the emotion, the conversation, you know, the pause, the laugh, the tone of voice? If so, then maybe I don't want to just write a blog because they might miss out on some of those things. So it's really looking at the idea and the story that you want to tell and figuring out, well, what characteristics, what what 
tools do I need at my disposal to tell this story in the most effective way possible? And that really gives you a good clue about where you want to start in terms of what format to bring it to life. Um, the other thing I would say is you very rarely, or you should very rarely, be choosing only one format. Uh, I'm guessing you've had conversations on here before about content repurposing, but mm -hmm. really the, the best thing you can do is decide where you're going to put that content first versus what kind of content you're going to create in some sort of silo. Because, you know, we all know that, you know, you create a video, that audio could be used as a podcast. Or, you know, mm -hmm. you do a podcast and you record video at the same time. Now you've got content for YouTube as well. You break it up into clips for uh, TikTok if that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. So it's it's not so much about choosing one format. It's about seeing which formats are the right fit for the way I have to deliver this message. Like, what do I need to do to deliver it well? And then how can I make maximum use of what I am creating? Yeah, that's such a that's such a great point. I was gonna I I had guests talk about that. Um, I'll link some of them in in the show notes, which you can find over at how I built that it slash two eight four. Um, but I was gonna ask you about that, right? Like, because like. I'm seeing a common question I get, right, is should I put my podcast on YouTube? And for a long time, I said, no, like if it's just like the audio bars, like that's not compelling yeah. YouTube content, but the winds are changing, right? And YouTube has been talking a lot about doing more for podcasters and how podcasters can take advantage of the video format. So taking your approach, right? Um, choose where you'll put it first and then see, you know, where it's the right fit. Maybe it is a podcast, but maybe you use a tool like Riverside. Full disclosure, Riverside has been a former sponsor of this podcast. Um, but you use a tool like Riverside to capture the video mm -hmm. and upload clips to YouTube or upload the whole thing to YouTube so that if and when they release their podcast app, your show is already there. Um, yeah. But just, just, and I should say I do this right now so that my library is on YouTube. But if you're looking to grow on YouTube, I don't think like just an image with like the audio bar is compelling enough video to make that yeah. show go viral. I think, I think there's a, a couple variables here. So one thing to know is that there are definitely people who treat YouTube like other people treat Spotify or Pandora. They mm -hmm. use YouTube, open in a separate tab, never looking at it purely just to listen, either to music or shows or, you know, conference talks, whatever it is. They view it as a listening platform. So there is a small faction of people who are using it that way. Um, to your point, I don't think that we're ever going to see that kind of thing go viral. Um, because again, it's just not, it's not super compelling to share. It's not super compelling to look at um, and probably doesn't get the same type of engagement on platform as stuff that's more visual would. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're clear on your strategy and you know why you're doing something, the examples you gave are perfect, right? Having, you're trying to build up a library for your channel. You're trying to build up, you know, a history of content. You're just trying to practice, you know, using YouTube and, and getting better right. at using the platform. There's, there's lots of benefits to that. Maybe you want to put it on YouTube because that's the easiest way for you to embed it into your site versus having to mm. use some other tool. You know, there's, there's lots of beneficial reasons, but I think, yeah, being super clear that, you know, it probably isn't going to be a great standalone, uh, channel, you know, channel if it's right. just, you know, this non-visual content, um, but, you know, there's there's other options, too. So if you say you do a great podcast episode and you don't have the visuals, you have really awesome audio, though, you could take sort of the, the Vox explainer approach and have illustrations made or on screen text that are sort of explaining some of the things that are happening. Uh, you could mix up the visuals with different, um, you know, B-roll footage that's relevant to what we're talking about. You know, there's there's a lot of ways you can kind of turn shorter clips or or the full clip into something that is actually compelling to watch. So it, I think it a lot of times it just comes back to that strategy, like why am I doing this? Because I think the biggest thing for most creators is this immense pressure to be everywhere and be doing everything, and it's just not sustainable. You know, from a human perspective, like there's only so yeah. many hours in a day, um, but also from a strategy perspective, if you are spreading yourself across 10 different platforms and 14 different content series, like the quality just can't be there. You're, you're going to sacrifice uh, results in, you know, in exchange for breadth. And that's not necessarily, 
you know, working to your advantage depending on your broader business goals. Yeah, that's such a great point. And actually it drives home something that um, last week's guest, Jeff Utek, talked about, which was um, be on the platform where your audience is. And yes. um, y- you really want to think about that. You know, like I said, I don't, maybe I'm missing the boat again on TikTok. Maybe <laughs> podcasters and people who are looking for a podcast coach are on TikTok. I need to do a little bit more research there. Um, but I, I know they're on Twitter. I know they're hanging out on Twitter. And my, my Twitter following has grown since I've really focused on helpful podcast content. Um, so I really, I really love your, uh, your approach here. I will say right there, definitely, you said there are definitely people who treat YouTube like others use Spotify. Mm-hmm. Recent statistics, um, I'm saying recent, like first half of 2022, um, mm-hmm. saw that especially podcast power users uh, or like podcast super fans, I forget how they're put, but people who listen to more than four podcasts in a week mm-hmm. um, discover new podcasts on YouTube. Um, and so that's really interesting, right? And I guess it makes sense, right? Because just kind of scrolling through your podcast apps directory, you're like, I guess that artwork looks cool. Like, is it going to yeah. be good though? So, um, well, it, yeah. you know, that's a, that just surfaced another thing, right? If there's another podcast in your niche or a podcast that speaks to your audience that is doing that, you get that power of, of algorithmic suggestion. So, mm-hmm. you know, if there's a similar podcast to you, or again, one that touches a similar audience and they're getting, you know, even moderate traction with their YouTube uploads, it, it might make sense for you to kind of strategically try to be the video that's recommended to come up after that, you know? Uh, such a good point. Yeah. So I think we just took, at least me, all the way from, I don't have your podcast on YouTube to... <laughs> Maybe have your podcast on YouTube, right? There's really good repurposing tools out there that'll make it easy for you to upload. Um, But have the right strategy, right? Don't just do, you know, you got to have like the right thumbnail and the right title and and that uh, YouTube is a whole other discussion. I want to circle back to something else you mentioned. Um, How do you tell the story correctly? You've mentioned story a few times. Um, I I struggle with this, but I've been trying to get better. How important is story in your in your content? I think it it's one of those things that's really hard to define. Like you know it when you see it, but you know what's the story of this podcast? You know it's kind of mm-hmm. hard to define upfront. But I think you know in a broader sense, story is what makes content easy to follow and then easy to reshare. And reshare could be the literal, like, you know, sharing in a text message, sending a link, or it could just be telling someone what you heard about, right? That like word of mouth factor. And that that can, can come in a few different ways. It could be suspense that you use to kind of keep people engaged to the end. It could be a uh, chronological order that you're kind of walking people through a process. And so they want to stay through to the end for the payoff. Uh, it could just be that you keep it entertaining and new things are happening and it's exciting and fun and, you know, surprising enough that you think there's probably more goodies to come. So I think there's, there's a couple ways to kind of get folks going in a flow, but I also think that story, it might be one of those overhyped words. And I know that that might sound strange coming from me since that's sort of my <laughs> thing, but you know, I don't know that most educational content, so say like a recipe or a tutorial, it would be kind of hard to say that's like a, a super compelling story, like step one, do this, step two, do this. That's not right. what we would typically consider a, a beginning, middle and end story. Um, but that kind of stuff can add a ton of value. So I think sometimes telling a, a beginning, middle end story uh, or showing someone's transformation over the course of a story, for example, can be super valuable. But I do think that story is probably not always the best tool, depending on what it is that you're trying to share with your audience. Yeah. And and to your point, like I've had, um, I've struggled, I've like straight up not published content that I thought was good from an educational standpoint, because I didn't have a good story to go along with it. Mm. Um and like, maybe, maybe I should, I, I mean, I've repurposed it as Twitter threads or whatever, yeah. but, um, but you know, I feel like, oh, well, I don't have a good story to tell at the beginning of this blog post to like set the stage or whatever. Right. Um, but like, like you said, maybe you don't always need that. Right. Maybe, maybe this content is for the person who's Googling, like, how do I come up with content ideas? You um, know- I feel like the best example for this, you know how we, people always make fun of recipe content that has a very long preamble, 
Yes. Like, that's a perfect example of like, I am here to learn how to make a casserole. I do not want to <laughs> hear about the first time you ever tasted casserole when you were at summer camp. Like, that's not <laughs> what I'm here for. I think there yeah. are plenty of situations where it's like, all right, there's a little too much story sprinkled on top of this substance. Like, I'm here for the cupcake, not for the frosting, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. And um, yeah, so, I, you know, the the way... The way I try to treat story in in my own content is is driving the point home, right? I I mm-hmm. uh, I told a story about, um, oh, just yesterday. Actually, I keep saying yesterday, and it's true in both of these contexts. So I'm not just saying it as like a general like the other day thing. Um, I had a lot of calls yesterday, uh, <laughs> but one was this guy was kind of talking about how he wants to teach people how to make better videos and all they want to know about is the gear. Like, what camera mm. should I get? And I said, and he's like, I, I really don't want to talk about that. And I, I, I told the story about how people would always ask me when they found out I was a good computer guy, especially when I was in college. Like, hey, Joey, I'm go-, people who knew me before 2008 called me Joey. Um, <laughs> hey, Joey, I'm going to college. I, I need a new computer. I really want to get a Mac. Should I get a Mac? And I'd always say, no, you don't need a Mac. Uh, <laughs> you, you're going to pay $2,000 for a, yeah. a computer that you're going to write Word, use for Word yeah. and surf the internet. You could pay mm-hmm. 600 bucks for a Dell. Yeah. Um, and, and then they'd say, but I really want a Mac. And I'm like, well, get a Mac then. And so I, I, <laughs> I said, people who want to know about gear, like if that's the hump that you need to get them over to get them to the... To, you know, make better videos through story or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, then just do a free video about the one camera you should buy to start mm-hmm. your YouTube channel. And he was like, "Man, that really drove the point." Like he's like, "That really helped." Uh, yeah. So using it, you know, judiciously, I think can be really helpful. I think it's sometimes easy to forget that our audience may have barriers that we've long since passed that we kind of have to help them over that hump. Just like you said, you know, it's easy. It's easy for us to say, like focus on how to make better quality videos. But if they don't even have their equipment set up yet, then like they can't make better videos because they can't make one to begin with, you know? So it's like, sometimes even though it feels like that basic content has been has been overdone like there's lots of stuff out there on how to pick a camera or like you know camera reviews and stuff but like mm-hmm. it's true but your audience may not have that stuff in front of them and they may want it from you and the other point is if people are out there looking for it wouldn't you rather they get their answers from you rather than you know potential competition for other stuff down the line so i basic content like that even if it's been done I think is a really important, you know, sort of foundation to your content strategy. This episode is brought to you by LearnDash. Look, I've been making courses for a long time. I've taught at the college level and I've created curriculums for several different organizations, including Udemy, Sessions College and LinkedIn Learning. When I create my own courses, there's no better option than LearnDash. LearnDash combines cutting-edge e-learning tools with WordPress. They're trusted to power learning programs for major universities, small to mid-sized companies, startups, and creators worldwide. What makes LearnDash so great is it was created by and is run by people who deeply understand online learning and adds features that are truly helpful for independent course creators. I love the user experience. And now you can import Vimeo and YouTube playlists and have a course created automatically in seconds. I trust LearnDash to run my courses and membership, and you should too. Learn more at howibuilt.it slash LearnDash. Again, your content really should tie back to um, what you're trying to do with it. I, my, mo- my most popular YouTube video is how to set up the Sony A6400. Mm-hmm. Um, because I watch tutorials and I'm like, all these people are photographers who like assume, you know, like everything mm-hmm. already. Um, and I'm like, here are the things that I, as a beginner, I didn't know. And like, that's really well performing aside from helping get my YouTube channel monetized, uh, which I mean, that's not like, that's not, I'm not rolling in dough from that. Um, <laughs> that doesn't align with my business goals or whatever. So I think that's another, uh, probably another thing that you need to consider, right? 
Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like we could all be out there making cat video compilations and like <laughs> news bloopers and we'd all, we'd all get tons of traffic, but like, is that actually going to translate into anything? And, you know, it's a really good thing to remember. It's not just about YouTube. Like we're talking about, I hear people say the same thing about like, Oh, I need to up my follower count on Twitter. And my question is always why? Well, I want Mm -hmm. more followers, but, but why, like, what does having more followers get you? Because I know your goal for the year is not just have, like, you can't pay your bills with followers. You can't like, you know, like you want those followers because you want them to do something. You want to influence them. You want to teach them. You want to, I don't know, sell something to them, refer them somewhere else. Like there's got to be a a bigger goal than just, you know, followers or views or whatever, right? It's got to be bigger than that or else you're not going to stick with it when it gets tough. Yeah, absolutely. It, it reminds me of uh, uh, the South Park episode when like YouTube started getting really big and and like Butters made a video. I don't know. Did you ever watch South Park? It's been a, it's been a while. I don't know that I remember this one. Uh, so like Butters made a video and like it got it went viral and um, they went to the place where like you get like the YouTube money. <laughs> and everyone's like, I have a million theoretical dollars, right? Just like based on yeah. their hits or whatever. And um, that really is what it feels like when you're like, oh, I just want more followers. Like this is all, it's like, it's almost like, you know, like working for exposure. Uh, like exposure yeah. doesn't pay to, the bills. To what end? Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, when when you follow that without sort of a a, a focus on your why, like think about you, that that video went went viral for you. If you had been chasing the virality and just made more videos like that, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing now. You'd be sort of boxed into this audience that cares about something different than what you care about. You know, you'd have a bunch of viewers who want content you don't want to make, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it would sort of, it would distract you from what you actually want to be doing. And so I think that's kind of a broader message for all of life, to be honest, because that's easy to do in your business outside of content too. You know, you get, yeah. can you do this type of project? And you're like, well, it's not my specialty, but I guess I could. And, you know, three more times that happens and suddenly you're doing stuff that's not at all related to your core competency. And that's taking time and effort away from the projects you love and the clients who who trust you with the stuff you like to work on. It's really easy to to chase what's working, what's like low hanging fruit and get so far from what it is that you actually love to do. Yeah. And, but the thing is, right. If you always chase low hanging fruit, you're never going to climb higher or whatever. There you go. Um, I really wish I hadn't ended that with, or whatever. That's a really good quote. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could edit just, this you part can, out. yeah, use it however you want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but you're, you're right. And it's like almost like niching down is a little scary. Like I've been turning down WordPress work, uh, mm-hmm. even though it's like easy for me um, because that's not where I want to be anymore. Right. In the pre-show, I told you I'm a recovering WordPress developer <laughs> and people are still like, can I hire you for WordPress projects? And I'm like, oh God, this would be like such an easy, like five or 10 grand. Like they're, they're ready, but it's not yeah. what I want to do. Yeah, And I know like five grand today could cost me like 25 grand six months from now yes. when I land that big podcast production client or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's this, um, it, it, again, it happens in life too, where it's like, do I want to be amazing at doing eighth grade homework or do I want to go to high school? Like you could stick around and keep doing eighth grade homework and get A's, yeah. but like, you're not really progressing, you know? Yeah. Like, you you want to move to that bigger pond. You don't want to become the biggest possible fish in a pond that you don't want to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's make a, a kind of a quick pivot here. All right. And and we've talked a little bit about um well, we talked about focus before format and and determining uh kind of where your content's gonna go and what are you saying and how do you say it. Yeah. I'm really curious because I over-engineer. Again, I'm a software <laughs> engineer, so I over-engineer everything. And I have like Siri shortcuts so I can like just <laughs> yell into the ether like I have an idea and it gets logged in the right place. Um, wh- how, how do you capture your ideas? Like what if you're like out on a walk and like or driving and inspiration strikes? What do you do? I think my answer is going to be very unsatisfying, but I will share it anyway. Uh and my answer to that is whatever system you use, because, because 
truthfully, like I could tell you, you need to set up Airtable or you need to use Notion or you need an elaborate system of Google Docs. Like it doesn't matter what I say, if you're not going to do it, if it doesn't fit into your lifestyle, then it's not going to work for you. So as unsatisfying as it may be, my recommendation, to be honest, is whatever system you're already using, find a way to use that to capture your ideas. So if you love Notion, if you're using Trello, if you're using ClickUp, like whatever it is that you use and love, that is where you should capture your ideas because that's pretty much the only way to ensure you're actually going to do it. Like I would much rather have you rig a system not meant for capturing ideas to actually capture them than to have a dedicated system that's completely empty because you don't have time to learn it or it just is like difficult to access or you forget, you know? So like I said, unsatisfying as it may be, what system you're using is the best system to capture your content ideas. No, that's exactly what I was hoping you would say, <laughs> right? Because again, this is like uh, uh, in a future, in an upcoming episode as this releases, um, Kara Chase says the same thing, right? Like don't use people, other people's playbooks and tools and things like that because you won't do it. For the longest time, I was like, I need to find the perfect CRM. Uh, <laughs> and they were all too complicated for me. And, and now I use a like a note-taking app called mm-hmm. Craft. I love it. I use it for everything. So I have a little folder called CRM and each person gets their own document. And then I can like link to actual meetings we have on my calendar, nice. which also gets their own document. Um, and that's perfectly fine for me because I'm in Craft all the t- like actively. Yep. That's where yeah. I'm taking notes for this for this interview. <laughs> well, it's sort of like, you know, if you equate it to like, you know, the fitness world where it's like, oh, what should I do to stay healthy? And it's like, well, if I tell you, you need to get a Peloton and you hate biking and you get on, you know, you never use it, then it's not actually a good solution, you know, same thing for whatever else, you know, you buy an expensive weight set. Like if you hate lifting weights and you're not going to lift them, then those weights are useless to you. So honestly, it, it, it's really easy to hide behind finding the perfect tool when you're afraid to start something new or you feel like some sort of imposter syndrome, like, oh, I'm out of my depth. What if I choose the wrong tool? Like the best time to start is today. And the best things to start with is the things that you have, because waiting around for another six months until you have the perfect tool is just six months wasted that you could have been making progress. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, um, I've said his name multiple times on this show now, and I think I'm going to say it wrong again, but, um, K he, I think is what it is. It's K H E H Y. Uh, he has, he gives a talk about how you can do $10,000 an hour work. Um, and that's like the stuff you should be doing, but like the yeah. hundred dollar an hour work is like finding the right tool and it's dangerous because it feels productive. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. Well, and I think there's probably like, I don't know, maybe this is more therapy than podcast at this point, but I'm sure there's certain personality traits and certain certain folks who are more drawn to that kind of thing. I know I, for one, can get sucked into sort of research procrastination really easily mm-hmm. if I'm not confident in a particular skill set or a particular process. Like the easiest way to put off having to do it is to convince myself that I'm learning more about it and I'll do it later, you know? So it's like, yep. it's pretty easy to get sucked into that Uh if you're not super confident or you're nervous or you have imposter syndrome, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I do like trying new things or whatever. Uh, and, and something that I'm, I'm, I think half jealous of, and then half, it gives me agita, um, <laughs> is, uh, which for those of you who don't know, that's like the Italian word for heartburn. Um, <laughs> uh, is Federico Vatici. He runs Mac Stories and he writes this tome every year that's like the ultimate, it's not called the ultimate guide, but it's like the ultimate guide for using the latest version of iOS and iPadOS. Uh And I feel like every year he changes his process to write this 50,000 word document and it kills me. But then I'm like, you know what? He is also like charging, like part of his membership is hit, is like just him trying new tools and apps. Yeah. So like this guy is getting like paid to tinker, which is super cool. Uh, and I would love that. But then like just thinking about like uh, changing my whole notes app again is like <laughs> anathema to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, that comes back to, I think, like figuring out the purpose of these things. Like 
-hmm. maybe getting paid to tinker and mess around and try new tools is the actual goal behind some of that versus making a ton of money or getting a million downloads or something, right? Like maybe, maybe the goals are different. I know I, for one, uh, I do a lot of writing projects that if you were to look at them on paper in the balance sheet, you'd be like, why the heck are you doing that? That is not worth your time. And it's like, well, I enjoy doing that. It gives me energy Mm -hmm. and allows me to do more of the things that I have to be doing, you know, or it allows me to stay connected with people that, you know, I want to maintain a good relationship with, or, you know, I don't know. I've always wanted to talk about this topic and I don't usually get invited to talk about it. And so it's fun to expand my authority or, you know, my experience. So there's, there's a lot more than money or views, you know, that can, can serve your goals as a, as a creator, as a human, uh, as a business person, you know? Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. Um, and now, uh, it's going to feel like we're cutting against that. Right. But I do want to ask you about, uh, branded content, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think a a lot of, a, a lot of my experience with sponsorship is from this podcast, um, but I I have been getting a few people paying me, you know, a, a, a reasonable amount of money to cover my time um, mm-hmm. to do like these paid reviews. And so I'm, I'm essentially getting paid to try a product on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. What I guess maybe first you can define like what is branded content? Is it always going to be like this sponsored thing? Is it always a blog post? How does mm. it work? So it can be just about anything, to be honest, which can be challenging. Um, But basically, at the highest possible level, sponsored content is, or branded content, there's lots of different names. Mm -hmm. Um, But this content is being created either in collaboration with or on behalf of a brand and probably would not have been created otherwise. That's like a really, a really Mm -hmm. broad definition. Um, But, you know, this episode, maybe you probably wouldn't have bought that product and reviewed that product in as much depth if you weren't affiliated with the brand. It could still be completely objective. It could still be super valuable, but it's not something you would have prioritized without that relationship with the brand, for example. Right. So again, that's a broad definition. It could cover a lot of things, but it's sort of, you know, content being created with some level of influence by the brand and it probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. Or it wouldn't have happened the same way. Yeah. I think like that part is so crucial, right? Because if you start to think, well, I would have made this content anyway, it's like really easy for you to devalue Mm -hmm. the work, right? Um, Yeah. You know, if you're like, oh, well, I want $1,000 for this YouTube video. Yeah. Uh, And then the brand is like, well, we will only pay you 300. Then you're like, well, I would have made this anyway. So like 300 is better than no hundred. Yeah. Um, But, but now you're, you're, again, the brand is going to have a little bit of influence. Um, I've had deals fall apart because like at a lower price point, they're like, we also need to review it and you need to make mm-hmm. revisions. And I'm like, nah, not at, like not at the price and you're that's, paying me. That's Yeah, that's not a standard sponsorship. Like, yeah. And I think that's that's another way you can differentiate it too is like, I always joke like sponsored means in most cases, if someone's just sponsoring something that would have existed anyway, they're buying squares and rectangles. They're buying real estate that exists that's sort of in between or alongside your content. Like mm. a standard podcast sponsor, they get the rip and read in the beginning, right? And they get yeah. the maybe a 15 second read in the middle and maybe something at the end and maybe a logo on your uh, show notes page, right? So they're really sort of an accessory to the content when they're just purely an outside sponsor. Um, if you're working with them to create content on a specific topic or you're interviewing one of their executives, right? That's more collaboration than a sponsor, mm-hmm. like an just a standard sponsor. And I think that's kind of the difference. And it's important to know that a brand involvement doesn't have to be a negative. It shouldn't. If a brand involvement is a negative, it's probably not a great fit. If you don't want to make it, it's probably not a great fit. If you're afraid your audience will hate it, it's probably not a great fit. You know, in an ideal world, you're working with a brand that you like or respect that has some value to offer to your audience. And so working together is a win for everyone involved. Yeah, that's, that's such a great point. I love that. And I'll share some numbers. I think they're public. Um, for a sponsored review on my YouTube channel, uh, which has about 2,300 views, uh, I charge about 550 bucks. And that's just like a five minute video of me using the product and giving my thoughts. It's honest. 
The brand has no say in it. It's basically mm-hmm. a sp- it's, it's sponsored content. Um, mm-hmm. They don't get to see it before it comes out. I send them a link, um, but it's it's totally up to them. If they want oversight, I four or five X that price. Yes. Right. So now Smart. we'll come up with an outline. We'll come up with a script before I upload it. You'll see it. You get one round of revisions uh, where it's not a reshoot because we wrote the script already. And yeah. then I'll release it. And then you can also use it. Right. And And then there's like the question of, can you use it organically for shared? Can you use it for mm-hmm. um, paid ads or whatever? Am I using you? Like, is there, is there exclusivity, right? Like, I can't use competing products for a, a yeah. certain amount of time. All of that has to be considered. And that is a perfect example of like, in one case, you might have written a review for a product just because you liked it. So maybe you would have written that review in the, in the straight up sponsor scenario, but you would not have independently reached out to the brand of your own volition to be like, Hey, do you want to weigh in on my, <laughs> uh, on my script for this upcoming video? Since I mentioned your product, like that would not have happened unless there was a deeper relationship there. So I feel like that's, that's a pretty good way to like pressure test and see like, are they just an advertiser? You know, are they just like, you know, sort of having really surface level involvement or is this a deeper partnership? And when the answer to deeper partnership is yes, that's a good chance that you're creating more sponsored content together. Like you're collaborating on something. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. And um, as far, I know like uh, if people are going to have questions, they're going to write in and be like, how do you get (laughs) branded or sponsored content? Do people reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? How's that work? So there's almost an endless number of ways that this stuff could happen. Um, There are folks out there who can act as agents for you and try to make these connections for in exchange for like a share of the, you know, the partnership or the payment Mm -hmm. or whatever. That may be a good option for you if you want to put exactly zero effort into it and you're fine with letting someone else take a cut. Um, there are also platforms out there. If you look for influencer apps, influencer platforms, there's sort of like, Tinder for influencers where you can go (laughs) ahead and get matched up with folks, you know, with brands who have similar audience goals or, you know, similar content types, or they're prioritizing the same networks that you're prioritizing, for example. Um, So there's a lot of those types of platforms out there. I don't have any one in particular I recommend because again, it really depends on what types of partnerships you want and what platform you're on. Um, But yeah, have a look at influencer platforms and see if there's one that aligns with your audience or, um, you know, your, your platforms of preference. Um, and, and the other way is, yeah, to, to try to do it more organically. So there's different ways to do that. You could try to reach out to the brands. You could look at the brand site or, you know, their, their presence and see if they have publicly posted information about how to become, you know, a brand ambassador or an affiliate or whatever else they offer. Um, I mean, and you can also just try to attract them by creating really great stuff. You know, if you're out here reviewing products from a specific brand regularly, you know, and you're tagging them, then there's a pretty good chance that they'll notice at some point. And maybe that will open up a conversation for a deeper relationship. Yeah, I like that a lot. And um, in uh, in a near future episode, I'll be talking to Justin more, more about kind of pitching brands. Um, but uh, when it comes to, I guess, what's your approach to creating that content? Um you know, do you have any kind of processes in place or advice for uh, people who may have never done it before and might be inclined to just, well, the brand is giving me money. So like, I'll do whatever they want. (laughs) Um, You know, I think, I think the most important thing is to try to find the overlap between what the brand wants to say and what your audience wants to hear. And that might sound super basic, but you know, there's a good chance that what the brand is trying to do and all the things they want to say that not all of it belongs on your content, on your channel, you know, not all of it applies to your audience. So it is kind of a process of looking at what they want to say, what they want to talk about, you know, the the visuals they use, whatever else, and ruling out the stuff that like, this isn't going to be at home on my channel, my audience won't trust this type of content, my audience doesn't care about this particular topic. But in doing that, you can identify, you know, okay, well, this product that you talk about, that's actually something my audience would really love to hear more about. Or, wow, you mentioned this thing as a side a side topic, but I get that question all the time. My audience would love to hear more about that. So it's kind of like a, 
a pruning process of all the different things that might be proposed or all the different messaging the brand might have out there to see what are the ones that that are going to be at home on my platforms, in my content, for my audience, and finding something something there. That's really where you want to you want to focus. And it might literally be making a Venn diagram to try to find where that overlap is between the things your audience cares about, the things that your audience trusts you to talk about, and the things that the brand wants to get out there in the world. Yeah, that's put such so succinctly. Find overlap between what the brand wants to say and what your audience wants to hear. Yeah. Um, I think a really good example is uh, early on in this show, I talked to WordPress developers. And so I can, you know, I'll, I'll use one of the sponsors for this week, uh, LearnDash. Um, you know, doing a sponsor read for LearnDash then might have been uh, uses the best coding standards, is performant. With a developer license, you can use it on as many sites as you want for your clients if you're creating online courses. Today, that sponsor read sounds super different because the mm-hmm. the audience is now creators. They don't care about developer licenses or know anything about JavaScript. Like they just want to <laughs> know, like, can I install this and easily create my course? So now yeah. I say, like, hey, with their playlist feature, you can make a playlist on YouTube or Vimeo and have the course automatically created. Nice. Yeah. So good. Exactly. I love LearnDash. Like they're, they are this week's <laughs> sponsor, but I've been using them for years. <laughs> See, and that, that's the other thing that you can't overestimate is like, you gotta, you have to actually care because if, if you don't care about the sponsoring brand and you're, it's like lip service and your audience can tell that you don't like it, or they can feel that there's no emotion there, that you're just like reading a script. It's not going to do for either of you what, what you want it to do, right? It's not going to convert the way they want it to the brand. It's not going to connect with your audience the way you want your content to. So I don't know that if there's one place in your content to really stand up for your values and and what you like and what your audience expects from you, then like selecting your sponsors, selecting your partners is a hundred percent the place to be because you're really, you're bringing their reputation and yours into the same space and your audience is trusting you. So really choosing carefully and making sure you can stand behind them and, and you agree with what they offer is, is so, so important, especially when you're starting out because a couple, a couple bad choices there could really start to hurt your audience trust. Yeah. Oh, again, put so succinctly, you're bringing their reputation and yours into the same place. And I've said like, I've said to people like, especially podcasts, like people trust the podcast host Mm -hmm. and whatever the brand is willing to pay you is not worth more than that trust. Like Mm -hmm. it's uh, so put really well. This episode is brought to you by Store Builder from Nexus. When it comes to setting up an e-commerce site, you have a choice between easy but limited or a limitless platform that you need to manage yourself. Until now. Store Builder is e-commerce made easy for everybody. It saves you time and delivers a storefront that lets you get to selling. As someone who set up multiple e-commerce sites, I can tell you that Store Builder has been a much easier experience than anything else. Answer a few questions, add your content, and sell. Store Builder was created and is supported by e-commerce experts at Nexus. Get the speed, security, and support you need when you need it. Are you ready to launch your perfect online store? Head over to howibuilt.it slash storebuilder for a special offer. That's howibuilt.it slash storebuilder. As we kind of wrap up here, the main interview, I, I we haven't mentioned this, but um, Melanie has a background in journalism. So in Build Something More, hmm. we're going to talk about how journalism has changed in the last 10 years. And you should stick around and see if we talk about the newsroom because I love that show. Uh, <laughs> you can become a member for 50 bucks a year over at the show notes page, how I built it slash 284. Uh, again, 50 bucks a year. That's less than five bucks a month, which is less than the iced coffee I'm drinking right now. Uh, so check it out. How I built it slash two, eight, four. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, if this is a, a three act play, act one was coming up with ideas. <laughs> act two was getting those ideas sponsored or getting your content sponsored. Let's make act three, getting people to click. So one of the mm. resources that you have on your website uh, is tips on how to write 
uh, or headline templates, I should say, 300 headline templates. (laughs) Writing headlines is one of the hardest things for me because I feel like it's because of my like software development and engineering background. I just want to be matter of fact, like this article is about you know, WordPress or whatever. Like, <laughs> Here you like, will find an article. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like very like Ron Swanson-esque. Um, yeah. That's probably not a good way to write headlines, I'd imagine. You know, it depends on the type of content. If I'm in a manual of some kind, if I'm like in user FAQs or support documentation, then like I definitely don't want you being clever. You know, I mm. want it to be super, super clear because I'm looking for, you know, assistance, you know? Um, and that's true for a lot of educational content. Like, how to fix, you know, such and such is a great headline for people who are searching how to fix such and such. Like that's mm-hmm. exactly what they're looking for, right? Yeah. Um, if you're trying to be super clever and you're like, is your such and such making a funny sound? Here's how to make <laughs> the sounds better. Like that's not going to get the people you need, right? So it is always going to be a balance between being clever and being clear. And that's true of like all copy, all content that you want to create. So a lot of, you know, talking about headlines is, well, what, what balance do I need here? How clever can I be versus how clear can I be? And different types of content, different audiences, you know, different levels of seriousness. The way, the way you might talk about, you know, so what's the deal with NFTs where you can be like <laughs> lighthearted and kind of, you know, yeah. jokey is probably very different from like how to select the right you know, burial service for your loved one. Like you probably mm-hmm. don't want to be like, LOL, someone died. What do you do right. now? Like that's the <laughs> definitely the wrong tone, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's always a balance for sure between clear and clever. Um, but a lot of what headlines are is, is really kind of like a formula. Um, I am nothing if not a pattern seeker and, and pattern finder. And so, um, a lot of what I talk about is figuring out, well, what's the purpose of this headline? Is it to, entertain? Is it to um, educate? Is it to compare? Is it to, you know, what is this content doing? Um, is, is, you know, once you can identify that purpose, like this content is designed to blank, then there are certain types of headlines that work really well for that particular format. So for example, if you're creating content that is helping people decide between multiple options, then you can use a versus type structure. Uh, Product A versus product B, which is right for you. How to decide between product A and product B, which is better for blank, product A or product B, right? There's sort of like a a versus formula that you can iterate on. Um, Or you could focus on the question itself, which is the best product for this purpose? Which product is right if I have X, Y, Z? So there's, there's sort of like predictable uh, headline formats that work really well for particular types of content. So that's really what um, that particular resource that you mentioned on on my site is is dedicated to that, you know, sort of sorted by content purpose. What are the headlines that structures that might work well for this? Gotcha. I like that a lot, right? I think that's something that, I mean, I don't want to say it's because of the acquisition, but <laughs> Wirecutter did this really well for a long time, right? Like, yep. you know, the best baby stroller or whatever, mm-hmm. the best the best baby stroller for Disney World. Mm-hmm. Um, super good, right? Now, I don't know if it's just me, but like anytime I, I search for like best whatever for whatever, I don't see Wirecutter or the New York Times like show up anymore. And maybe that's just because it's paywalled and they've mm. really, they've really kind of reduced the the search engine uh, optimization, but that doesn't sound like very prudent, right? Like even <laughs> if you pay wallet, you still want showing up in search. Yeah, I I can't say exactly. I know I was at the New York Times. I did was there during the acquisition. I have not worked directly on the wire cutter stuff, so I don't have any insight into there to share. Unfortunately, um, I did not know that. This is yeah. like, this is why I'm like a bad interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, it's been it's been quite a while, you know. So yeah. it's not it's not in my recent history. So don't worry. It's a it's I'm pulling a fact <laughs> out of the archives here. Nice, nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that exact type of structure that you were talking about before is is very journalistic in nature you know there it's 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 coming from that journalism stuff so it makes sense that you know early on in the acquisition they would have um which i think was like 2014 or 13 um they would have been really focused on trying to optimize those headlines by using their their new access to journalistic resources that makes total sense yeah that's that's really interesting um i think the 
Well, the last thought I just had was fleeting. Um, about <laughs> oh, right. I think I also think I'm I'm maybe a little bit stuck in this rut because I have been trying to do more YouTube and like YouTube. There's a stat that like eighty percent of people click because of the headline or the thumbnail, mm-hmm. uh, and so like you got to write these super clickbaity headlines, and I think I've let that like pollute my thinking a little bit on like titling my podcast episodes and my blog yeah. posts and and I, you know I think the matter of fact headlines especially for my blog posts which are mostly educational probably work I shouldn't be trying to serve the YouTube algorithm on my own blog well you know it, it's it's that's a balance too and I know this is kind of like a crappy answer but it is always a balance because at the end of the day you know robots uh, appealing to the algorithm may get people to your content, but it's not going to get them to stay. The robots don't engage, you know? So you got to appeal, appeal a little bit in order to get people there, but you got to make sure that it's not, you know, it's enough to get people to stay and that you're not misleading them or, you know, sort of over promising, under delivering things like that. Yeah. I think that that's a really good thing to, I mean, Again, as a programmer, like it depends was always our favorite thing to say. So like that's it just there's so many factors like you anybody who says like the one thing that you can do to do this is probably being disingenuous. Yeah, Um, exactly. The, the, The one secret, the silver bullet, the one thing you need, like that stuff may work for the clicks. But most of the time you read that content and you're like, okay, that was a little oversimplified. Yeah, for sure. You know, I stopped. Here's a, I'll give this example and then we can, um, we'll wrap up with like where people can find you and where they can get these great guides. But um, I straight up like stopped watching Screen Rant because all of their headlines were like that. And like I watch new rock stars now. I don't know if you're like into movies and pop culture. I clearly am because I've made like 400 (laughs) pop culture references in this interview. Um, But like Screen Rant would always be like, like villain of Doctor Strange 3 revealed and it's like like super heavy theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's not revealed. That's like what we think. And like at least new rock stars is like, this is our theory. And Screener is like, this is fact. Well, and that's, I mean, that's the reader trust thing that we were talking about before, right? If people keep clicking on content and not getting what's promised, then they're going to stop clicking because they know it's not going to be what's promised. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Melanie, this has been great. I feel like I always ask for like two to three, like one or two rather action items, but I feel like <laughs> we kind of have one for each act <laughs> of uh, of this episode. Um, and so I would say you've got these really great, really affordable guides on your website. Um, can you talk a little bit about those and how people can get them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on the website, storyfuel.co, you can check out the store. There's tons of printable resources that hopefully will help serve your content needs. Uh, nothing is is more than 20 bucks. So it's all, you know, bite size, help, helpful stuff. Um, everything from, you know, content ideas that are fully fleshed out that you can adapt to use for your brand. Um, we've got the headline guide. So again, there's like hundreds of uh, formats that you can use, you know, formulas for your headlines. Uh, and there's also a, a big workbook that is the companion to my book, The Content Fuel Framework, How to Generate Unlimited Story Ideas. Uh, and that workbook will, it's like fill in the blank, multiple choice, uh, handhold you through coming up with literally thousands of content ideas. So uh, those are all on the website at storyfuel.co. Uh, and we have a, uh, a discount code. So if you use the code Joe, um, for obvious reasons, you will be <laughs> able to uh, to save several dollars on, on any of those printable resources. Uh, so, you know, help yourself find the one that speaks most to you. And, and hopefully that helps make it even more accessible for you. Awesome. I love it. Thanks so much for the discount code. I appreciate it. I know my audience will appreciate it. I am without a doubt picking up the headlines one um, <laughs> and probably the workbook because I like I have again, I have this over engineered system for coming up with ideas, but um, I'm always, always interested in other approaches uh, and and seeing how other people do it. So um, Melanie, this has been great. If I, you know, I think we have the answer to this, but if people want to learn more, where can they find you? <laughs> Yeah, you can check it out at storyfuel.co. Um, that is really the home base for everything. You can find my social links there. You know, any anything you might want to know about the books, uh, upcoming book, anything, um, you can find at storyfuel.co. But 
I always like to mention that uh, I am I am the only me. So if you search for Melanie Diesel, D E Z I E L, on your your network of choice, or you know, throw me into a, a search engine, you'll you'll find me wherever you're looking. Awesome, love that. I will put everything in the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 284. If you, now that we have that tidbit that uh, Melanie used to work at the New York Times, um, if you want to see how journalism has changed in the last 10 years, uh, become a member of the Creator Crew. Again, you can sign up over at howibuilt.it slash 284. But Melanie, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me and letting me share my story. My pleasure. Thanks so much to everybody listening. Thanks to our sponsors. And until next time, get out there and build something.